Jason Irwin, who is a clinician. Uh, Jason and Bronwyn Irwin, horsemanship, horse trainer from Northstock. Just a little bit of an introduction. Um, he's a horse trainer at Northern Livestock, clinician Jason Irwin, Irwin horsemanship, teaches 20 to 25 clinics a year, clinician at the largest horse expo in Canada, the U.S. Jason's going to elaborate a little bit more on his bio, so that everybody
and uh, we would go down, my dad and I, and we would buy anywhere from six to ten maybe, usually nine, and uh, we'd come home and then it was our job to train them up and then we'd sell them from there. And it was sort of a running joke, every time we went down, I had to listen to the same line from my parents, and it was, oh, the trailer helped nine horses first off. We could buy six. Six, six good ones would be a good number. Yep, we'll get six. Five, five would be good. We could buy five. The plenty, of, that's lots. Four would even be good. Trailer held nine, we bought nine every single time. So I don't know why we had to listen to spiel, listen to before every trip, but that was the way it went. I remember one particular time, we, I had to listen to this for about three weeks before we went, and it turned out we bought 10. <laughs> so my dad and I are there, and we put these 10 horses on, we couldn't quite get the door shut, and the two of us are rocking back and forth, trying to get this whole group to step over so we can lock this door. What's flashing through my mind is, four or five is plenty. <laughs> like this. Anyways, off we went, <clears throat> and we did that for a lot. One thing about that, by being in the southern end of western U.S., I got to be around a lot of people that were pretty good horsemen and really good trainers. Now, they bought and sold horses as well, and I think that played part of the difference in because if you're a horse trainer, sometimes you can be not that good, but if you're a really good BSer, you can be fairly successful. And that, me not counted in that group. And that, but what'll happen is, oh, your horse isn't doing very well, but all we need is more time and more money, and we'll, he'll do really well. And that when you train this for yourself, it's a little different story because you have to get results. And that you can't, there's nobody you can string along. If your horse doesn't know how to do something, you need to figure out a way to teach that horse that and get on with it. So although I would say it was sort of a high pressure learning environment in some ways, I think it sort of set, set the stage for me more than anything else. So that was kind of where I got started as far as the initial training. After that, I sort of got interested in cold starting competitions. And uh, if, I won't go on too much about them, but basically what those are, you'll have anywhere from three, four, five trainers, and everybody will either draw a colt or get a colt assigned to them. And the young horse you'll get will usually be something like a three-year-old that's never been saddled, bridled, or ridden in its life. And you get anywhere from an hour to an hour and a half per day over the course of maybe two, three days. At the end of that, you have to turn out a colt that can go walk, trot, low, under saddle, stop, back up, and probably and do an obstacle course. Some of the obstacles would be weaving through cones, roping something, dragging it, loading a trailer, and stuff like that. And you've got a grand total of anywhere from three to four hours to get that horse ready to do all those things. And that now, that might sound like rushing, and I guess you could make that argument in some cases, but what it did, it really, really forced me to refine out my training program as I went along. Because if I got stuck on any one thing too long, we were sort of out of it. Also, if you got into a lot of fluff, fluff that really didn't matter, pick a point that really wasn't relevant, again, you're sort of in trouble. So you had to have a program that was really, really functional to get a lot done. So it's not that those are the most important things in the world, but I do, again, feel it helped me improve my program. Also, I got involved in Liberty Horse Training, and uh, what that is, basically, if you've never seen it before or heard of it, it's where you can cue a horse to do different things while it's not wearing any cap. So uh, a lot of times you'll see that in the movie horse world. They need a horse to come running up and stop so the camera can focus in on and stuff like that. I don't really consider that training absolutely essential, but I did find that it really improved my cold starting because to be any good at liberty, you have to get really good at watching a horse and sort of knowing what they're gonna do before they actually do it. You have to be one step ahead, and I felt that really helped me with later on with my cold starting because after a while, I could see when that colt was a little bit upset and make a change instead of falling off and thinking, ah, that colt was upset. <laughs> and uh, so again, I feel that helped me quite a bit. Now, I'll kind of get away from the part going on about me, although I hate to get off that topic. <laughs> and, uh, just some points I'm going to make before you maybe think about training your young horse. Maybe you have one, maybe you're thinking about training yourself. Maybe you're going to send them to a trainer, or maybe you're just interested in training generally. But uh, it is important to start off with a horse that you feel you're gonna have some success with. Now that might sound like a fairly obvious thing, but you'd be surprised how much it isn't. So what I'm saying there is, find a horse that you think you can have success with. Now, be aware when you're doing that, some horses you're gonna start them, you're gonna think this one's gonna be easy as pie, and that's the hardest horse of the bunch. Other time you're gonna think this one's gonna be a real nightmare, 
it turns out it's easy. So they'll really fool you, so don't get too locked into this. But sometimes we'll have somebody phone up and they'll say, oh, I have a horse, you go out in the field, it runs me out of the field, it bites, strikes, kicks, hates everybody, hates other horses, try to kill the neighbors. Bottom for the grandchildren to learn to ride on. <laughs> and uh, you do, until you start training horses, you have no idea how much people hate their grandchildren. <laughs> and there are so many of them that have pulled that trick. I'm starting to think there's a really good insurance policy going around on them. This is sort of a way to tip them off. But anyways, again, the same thing. If you want to go to the Olympics and be a show jumper and you send a horse for training that's 13 two hands tall, probably isn't going to happen. So again, try to start with something successful. What will happen if you have a horse that just is not going to work, and if you're not a very realistic person, you're going to send the horse from, horse for training and then you're going to go home crabbing that the horse or the trainer were no good. And really it's not pointing fingers, but you have to sort of understand, you need to start with the basics of what you're looking for in a horse, and what you need one to be. You can definitely improve on a horse, I'm not saying they all need to start off as the ideal candidate. You can make them better, but you're going to make life a whole lot easier on yourself if you start with something you at least feel can go and do the things you need it to do. Um, I wrote an article not too long ago. It was called, Should I Start My Colt Myself or Send to the Trainer? And I'm not going to read it off, but just a couple points I put in it. If you're thinking about starting your own colt, ask yourself some questions and be honest about it. Uh, say to yourself, am I a good rider? If the answer is yes, then you can think about starting your own. But if you sort of know deep down that you're not, don't take that as a, as a black mark against you. Just be aware of it and be aware that somebody else might be the f better person to get on that horse in the very early stages of training. Another one is whether you have confidence when you're riding a horse. So you can be a very good rider as far as you sit up straight and correct and you look, look the part, but you need to be able to stay calm under pressure to some degree. So for example, if you're riding a coal and it spooks and jumps a little bit, if you can go with it and then ride off like it never happened, chances are nothing else is going to come of it. If that colt spooks, uh, excuse me, spooks a little bit and you clamp down, squeeze for dear life, chances are now you've thrown gas on the fire and that colt's going to react even harder than that. So with colt, with a younger horse, usually they'll, they, when they start to react, you'll have a chain reaction much quicker than you would with an older horse. A young, an old one that's been ridden forever might spook, but he'll just walk out of it. The young horse doesn't know, you don't really know where that spook is going to stop sometimes. They're going to basically take the lead from you. If you're calm, cool, and collected, chances are they are. And uh, the comparison I make is if you were going for a drive someday, and you were in the passenger seat and somebody else was in the driver's seat, if you're going along, that car hit ice, and start to swerve a little bit, if the driver grabbed the wheel, just got straightened out, and then drove off calmly, your heart might be beating a little bit, but you're probably going to think to yourself, this person's got things in control, and I feel pretty good about this. If you're going along, that car hits ice, and the driver screams, we're all going to die, <laughs> then straightens out the car, chances are the rest of the drive, you're going to be like this. <laughs> Maybe we should stop. You look tired. I can take over for a minute. That's the same response your cult is going to have. So just keep that in the back of your head. Uh, should say here. The other thing I'm going to mention quick is make sure you have the time dedicated to working with your young horse. If you plan on riding them once a week, that'd be about the same as sending a kid to school once a week. They aren't going to learn a thing. Again, you're better off have somebody else put the foundation on and then you can take it from there when they don't need, need maybe as much consistent work. Uh, if you're going to send your colt to the trainer, just a few points. A lot of times people will ask me, what should I do with my horse before I send him to the trainer? Now I'm talking about under saddle horses, I don't know a whole lot about the driving world, so I won't get into that one, but for me personally, that's always a little bit of a toss up. I would like if the colt was halter broke well, he would stand to be tied, you can touch him all over his body with your hand without him reacting too much. And I would like him to be respectful and stay out of my personal space. If they have that done, I pretty much feel I can get on with it from there. If you don't want to do more training than that, that's fine with me. I don't feel that I need it personally to get going. Even if your horse doesn't know those things, chances are I would still take the colt in for training, but you just sort of have to be aware, excuse me, if your colt isn't hauling or broke very well, some of the initial time is going to have to get dedicated to getting that horse halter broke before you can start the under saddle work. 
Uh, sometimes I'll get a cold sent for training and the person will say, I'd like this cold started. I say, fine. And they drop it off and they'll say, oh, by the way, he also doesn't lead very well. He doesn't load very well. He doesn't pick up speed very well. You can't catch him with anything short of a tranquilizer rifle. And uh, <laughs> I'd like you to fix all that too, just while you're at it. And you're thinking, well, now you're talking about another month of training. This isn't just 50 extras that get tossed in. This is a whole lot of stuff that horse is missing. And you have to go back and do it properly to really have a horse you're going to have any success with. A horse only has the ability to learn so much in a day. You can't just keep adding more and more and more to them or you're going to have them either sort of freeze up, lock down, or turn off in that. So have your horse set up so that when he goes to the trainer, that trainer can put the effort into the places that matter. It doesn't make a whole lot of sense sometimes to be paying the trainer to do the things you could have easily done yourself, but then expect them to automatically know all that stuff. Um, if you do send your horse to the trainer, if there's any problems you've had with your horse, for instance, say you tried to start on yourself and it hasn't gone well and you just kind of felt like you were overmatched a little bit, that's perfectly fine. It would be better off to maybe have sent them to the trainer, but do let the trainer know any problems you've had. Sometimes what will happen is a person will try to start their own cold, get in trouble, they may be a little bit embarrassed to admit they got in a little bit over their head, they'll send the horse in and they'll say, oh, he's never been touched, we haven't done anything with him. And if you've done very many of these things, you can watch them and you know pretty darn fast it has been played with, but you don't know in what way sometimes. So now you have to try to figure out what went wrong, so that you go fix those holes, you don't even know where they are. And that, so if you do get in trouble, just be honest about it, and chances are things will work out just fine in the long run. If you are going to train your horse yourself, uh, if you're going to start off and this is your first time doing it, go slow. Make sure every step is good before you move on to the next step. Get a really solid base in order to build off of. Now, I know I just said a minute ago that I'll start them relatively quickly. But again, I've done it quite a bit, so I've refined it in my program over the time. When I do a cold starting demonstration, I'm always saying the words, this is what you can do, don't copy this exactly the way I'm doing it. Use the techniques to spread it out over a much, much longer length of time. And that when you're training yourself, usually time is much of a concern. If it takes you a week or a month for that, it doesn't really matter. You're going to own that horse for its whole life. So better to err on the side too slow than a little too fast. Um, just speaking to personalities of horses, the easiest horse to train is going to be one that's quiet, respectful, and well-mannered. I think that's probably a given. Most colts don't fit into that category when they get sent in for training. I wish they did, and that, but they don't. Most are going to err one of two ways. One would be you'll have a horse that's very, very quiet, but a little bit rude. So this will be the horse that's been handled a lot. They like people. They genuinely don't mind being around them. They like their good to get along with in that way, but at the same time, there may be the horse that hits you with their head or pushes you out of the way and don't have, doesn't have a whole lot of manners and stuff like that. That horse there, basically the program is going to be whatever the program is, but you're going to have, the trainer's going to have to be a little bit firmer probably than the owner has. They're going to have to draw a line in the sand and say, this is what you're allowed to do and this is what you aren't. We aren't going to blur that line. It's either everything becomes a yes or a no with that type of horse. The other type is the horse that is respectful, but they're scared. So they're respectful, but they're respectful in a bad way. That would be the horse that when you go in the pen, he's kind of in the back of the stall. He'd prefer to be away from you if he could be. One like that's going to take a lot more patience. You might not draw quite as firm a line with that horse just because you have to get them to start liking you a little bit more. It's going to take you a little bit longer. Something you do have to be careful of, though, with that type of horse is you don't want to start feeding off of their energy. And what I mean by that is a lot of times I'll see somebody working with a nervous horse and the horse will be standing there and they're going up to it and they'll be like this. Easy, easy, be calm, be calm. Like this. And then they're like, he's very spooky. No kidding. <laughs> and that, so if that's the way you react, that may be, again, not the horse for you. If you walk up to him like, good day, pet, 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 the colt might be nervous at the start, but chances are he's going to be like, well, he seems good with that, so it must be okay. And that, so that's, again, sort of where you get them building off your energy. You want to have it where your horse is reacting to you, not you reacting to your horse too much. And that, every time they do something, you're trying to 
kind of react to that, that's not so good. You have to be the leader in the relationship and have that horse sort of look to you for guidance. And that's so just something to keep in mind. One other point, this isn't maybe that important because you probably don't have a horse like this. The worst horse to deal with is the horse that has both of those problems. That means they're, they're rude and hard to get along with at the same time they're scared of you. Usually when I run into these, it's been a man-made problem. What it, that usually is, you, it, is, is you have a horse that's been really, really spoiled. So the owner has let them away with absolute murder. They can run over the person, they can bite them, they can kick them, they can do whatever they want, and the person will stand there and take it and then feel like they're being their friend, which they're not. And, that, and then what's happened is that horse has then been sent out to a trainer. The trainer has tried to fix it by being really, really rough to try to put some manners on that horse. So now you have a horse that started off rude and uh, ignorant, and now he's scared on top of it from the trainer. So in that scenario, now you have a horse that's very, very hard to train one of those because if you go in, you're firm, you risk scaring them. If you go in and you're passive, he's going to mow you over. And that, so the, again, the good news is there's not a lot of those horses around. If you have one, do not try to start them. Send them to somebody that's pretty good at doing something like that. The only other type of horse that I find that kind of fits that category, sometimes if you have a big dominant horse that has not been handled very much. So what you might see there is a horse that's maybe born on a big ranch, they run in a big herd, they're semi-feral, they haven't handled a lot. If you get the dominant horse of the bunch and start working with them, sometimes one like that, they're scared of people because they're scared of everybody in general, but at the same time, they're also, that's the horse that if there's a pack of wolves, they're willing to stomp the wolf. You might be the wolf in that case. <laughs> and uh, so just kind of, again, that's sort of the horse that you're not probably going to run into. You probably don't know him, so I won't worry too much about it. Um, I should say just a little bit on equipment that you're going to use to start your colt in. There's all kinds of different headgear. I'm not going to get too much into it. Typically, I start colts in a snaffle bit. That's one like this. It's a bit with no shanks on it. And uh, when you pull, for every pound of pull you put on that bridle, a horse feels one pound. With a curb bit, when you pull, that horse might feel two pounds or three pounds, depending on the length of the shanks and all kinds of other factors. But for the most part, this is the way I start colts with one of these. The nice thing about them is, if you get on a colt that tries to do something silly, if you've prepared that colt, chances are you can talk them out of it. So what I mean by that is if they go to throw their head down and they're thinking of bucking, if you pull them around, usually you can get them stopped before it ever starts. You do want to teach them to get to the bridle on the ground before you ever get on them, but it's the way I like to go about it. Having said that, if you have rough hands, then I wouldn't recommend the bed as much. A lot of times what a person will do today is they'll put a rope halter on their colt, they'll work their colt around, and then they'll tie the lead rope around to form a set of reins and ride them with the rope halter and the reins. That can work pretty good. You don't have as much control, so if you're going that route, you probably have to make sure that you keep one step ahead of your colt, because if they go to do something a little bit silly, by the time they do it, you might be a little too late to change their mind. You have to kind of be keeping them out of trouble before trouble ever happens. Uh, the person that actually started getting people riding with rope halters was the, the trainer I mentioned earlier, Ray Hunt. Now, the reason everybody thought it was due to kindness, and it wasn't, it was because you would go to a clinic, try to show people how to start their colts. They would get on, get scared, reach on both rings to slow their colt down, the colt would freak out and throw them off. And uh, so then what he started doing was putting rope halters on and tying the reins around, the lead rope around and form a set of reins. What happened there was, they would get on, still reef on their horse's face, the horse would get scared and throw them off, same result. <laughs> so then what he started doing was he put them on halter, lead rope, but they were only allowed to pull the lead rope one way. They wouldn't tie it around, you only had one rope. You would steer them one way, you would flip the rope over their head and steer them the other way. That way nobody could pull back straight on their colt, not as many people fell off. It was harder to teach their horses to steer, but they didn't get into as much trouble. I was told at one point he took a step farther, he put people on colts and took the halter off and let them go. I guess he did that a few times, everybody hit the dirt and they came up with another plan in that, so just something to keep in mind. Uh, also, the, the training location you have, I don't want to dwell on this stuff too much, but um, round pens, arenas, stuff like that, wherever you're going to stride your young horse in the beginning, I prefer a round pen. I just like it because I can get on and focus more on my riding than my steer. 
Sometimes that cold isn't going to steer all that well. If I get on, get that cold moving, he's going to move around the pen. In most cases, not too bad. In that case, you're probably pretty good. If you get into a big arena, if your colt starts running, you've got a lot of room for that colt to build up speed. He might swerve out the wall, something like that. The round pen, once they've gone around a little bit, they kind of understand there's really nowhere to go, so they tend to start slowing themselves down. So I do prefer the round pen, but if you don't have one, you can definitely get away without it. Typically, the rule of thumb is, the bigger the area you're going to start your cold in, the more work you want to have done on, on him before you get on. You want to have more control if you're planning on stepping on that cold in a bigger wide open area. Um, if you're going to get a helper to help you with your cold, that's fine. I feel there's an unwritten rule in the horse industry that says once you've owned a, a horse for more than a week, you are now an expert and it is your, un, it is your unwritten duty to tell everyone you know about all your knowledge. <laughs> now, again, I'm not talking about me. And that, but, You'll have somebody that got a horse last week and then they go around telling everyone how to do it and offering to help everybody. Say thank you and then tell them you're busy that day and then start it when they're not around. And that a helper can be a real help to you if they really know what they're doing, but if you get somebody that's inexperienced, it's a real detriment because when you're working with a young horse, it's up to you to keep the horse safe and yourself safe. If you have a third person, third party involved, now you have to watch out for them as well. So you've made your job harder unless they're pretty handy what they do and they know how to get out of their own way, basically. Um, just one quick topic I get asked about a little bit is Western versus English. If you look at my hat, you know which one's better. <laughs> and, uh, having said that, and, uh, in the early stages of training, it really isn't going to matter a darn. Whether you're a Western rider or an English rider, the idea, the basics are still the same. You want a horse that gives willingly to leg pressure, gives willingly to bridle pressure. You want them calm, soft, relaxed with the rider on their back. It doesn't matter whether you want to ride bareback or an Australian saddle, that stuff's all the same. Your first 30 to 60 days isn't going to matter. If you decide to go on and go specifically into one discipline to show, that's, then you're maybe going to start to notice some differences between the disciplines. I would maybe say, if you plan to ride both Western and English with your horse, I would tend to say, tend to lean towards putting the Western saddle on first for the first few rides. Uh, that's for a couple reasons. One is just bigger. You're going to sit in a little deeper, you've got a little more to hold on with, so for safety purposes, if you can ride both, I would maybe lean towards the Western. Also, if uh, your horse, if they're used to the Western saddle, they're used to something big and a little bit heavy on their back, then when you switch to the English saddle, it's going to feel like they're wearing a postage stamp. It's easy. If you go put the English saddle on first, but then later throw a big Western one on, the horse might feel a little bit awkward, stuff like that. Having said that, as long as you get them ready, they'll be used to it in 10 minutes, so don't worry too much one way or the other. If you are an English rider and you're more comfortable in the English saddle, then definitely put the English saddle on. You want to ride something you're used to and comfortable with. Uh, basically, the rule is good riding is good riding, good training is good training, and I don't think that's going to going to matter one way or another. I know I've talked to people that they're Western riders, they won't listen to what the English people have to say, and the English riders won't listen to the Western people have to say. Most of those horsemen, most of those people's horsemanship goes to a level and stops for solid. And that because when it comes down to horse training, it's horse training, you want to learn everything you can from anybody you can. And that, so don't sort of let that get in your way. Uh, something I was going to mention here quick is sensitizing and desensitizing. Basically all training fits into one of those two things. Sensitizing is when you want your horse to react to something. An example would be if you want your horse to turn to the right, you might pick up on the right rein. As soon as that horse starts to turn, release that pressure. The faster you can release it, the faster that horse is going to learn it. That's why some people can progress with their horses a lot faster than others. It's basically not that the, the better trainer doesn't do more, they actually do less. You'll ask for something, the moment they respond, you just tell them they're on the right track. And it's basically, if you've ever had a little kid walk up to you, and they've drawn you a painting, if you've ever had that, and they walk up, look what I made you. And you're like, what is it? But you don't want to say so. Like, that's a very nice chipmunk. That's a dinosaur. Then you say, that's the best dinosaur I've ever seen. This is sort of the same way with cold starting. You're going to, when the cold responds even that little bit, you say, yes, perfect, that's exactly what I wanted. You pat on them and let them know they're on the right track. The quicker, the more you do that, the softer, the softer, the softer you can get. So that's sensitizing. Desensitizing is the total opposite. Desensitizing is when you keep creating a stimulus, a 
until your horse will not respond. An example of that would be if you're getting your horse ready to be saddled for the first time, you'd put the pad on the horse maybe, take it off, put it on, take it off, put it on, take it off, you just keep going and going and going until your horse just stood there and bored out of their mind. And that in that case, boredom is actually a really, really good thing. So you've made this, you've created a bit of emotion or something that might scare a horse, but you keep going until they're not scared anymore. Now, there, I don't want to get too technical, but there are two forms of desensitizing. One is gradual, that's the one you're going to want to use in 99% of cases. That's when you introduce something a little bit scary, then a little bit scarier, then a little bit scarier, and just keep building up and up and up. The other technique is one called flooding. Flooding is where you take something and just basically overwhelm the horse with it. Now, the problem with flooding is you're probably going to get killed before the horse gets used to whatever you're trying to show it. it the only time it really works is with like a foal. You maybe take a blanket or a tarp, rub it all over them, even if they're a little bit scary, you just keep going. And that, they'll get used to it. You try to do that with a big horse, he'll run, he'll run away with you and you just won't be able to hold on to him. So we'll kind of get away from that. Um, again, on the concept of effort and reward, you're really, you're basically you're not looking for a maneuver to be performed properly in the beginning. You're just looking for the horse to give you a good honest try. So an example would be teaching your horse to back up. If you pull on your horse and you want him to back up and you keep pulling, and your idea is I'm going to pull on you to you back up 10 steps, you're probably going to get into trouble. What's going to happen is the horse might start to back up because you're still on his face and still pulling on him. He's going to be thinking, I'm backing up, but I'm not being left alone. Hence, this must be what the person doesn't want me to do. So the horse will shut down on you or do something else. If that horse even leans back, you should release. Then you would pick up again, he leans, you release. You pick up again, he takes one step back, you release and pet him like crazy. You just want to reward the horse for getting on the right track. You're not rewarding them for what they completed, you're rewarding them for trying for you. And if you approach training like that, whether it be cold starting or any other kind, you're going to find you go a heck of a lot faster. Um, before I get on to any more here, I'm just going to ask real quick, are there any questions on anything up to this point? Anything on training Colts? That good or that bad? <laughs> <laughs> Do you have some suggestions for <laughs> developing confidence in developing young person? Okay. Is that something that you should be doing? Okay. Um, as far as regarding, regarding the question how you develop confidence in young horses, basically that is just keep exposing them to more and more, but fairly gradual. So like an example would be, if you're going to saddle up a young horse for the first time, if you walk out, throw the saddle on, cinch it up, chances are there's going to be a bit of a rodeo. If you went out, rub them all over with your hands first, later on rub them all over with a little blanket, later on put a light saddle on an awful lot of times, later on put a bigger saddle on, stuff like that. That gradual build-up is probably the, one of the biggest things. If possible, it's not always, but if you can trailer other places, that's a really nice thing to do. Let them see different areas, learn, teach them some stuff at home, and then play with those same things in a different field on your farm, a different pasture, go to another farm, things like that. Generalize your training quite a bit. Let them know that when I show you this, you don't only listen to me at, in this arena or this round pen, you need to listen to me everywhere stuff like that. So just keep gradually building up your training over time. If you overwhelm a young horse, of course, sometimes you'll really set them back. If you throw the whole book at them, sometimes they'll, <coughs> people expect them to maybe to blow up and buck and stuff like that, which can happen, but what sometimes happens is they'll just shut down on you. So you'll go along and they basically say, I can't figure this out, I don't know what you want, I'm going to my happy place. And then they just tune you out and basically close your eyes. If you've gotten to that point, you've gone way, way, way too far. And that's just something to keep in mind. That's why you want to have that gradual build up of steps. Uh, one thing I'm just going to mention here when you're working with your young horse, just because location is something that I mentioned in response to your question, is generally if you ride a horse in a, a confined area, so if you ride in a round pen all the time or an arena all the time, and you're always working on maneuvers and uh, bending, flexing, side passing, spinning, whatever you happen to be working on. If you do all that, usually what you end up with is a horse that has a really good handle on him, that feels like he's really broke, and then you take him somewhere else and he's really, he, then he just completely comes undone. You'll have a horse that's scared of everything in a lot of cases. There's a lot of horses, that, horses today being trained that uh, never leave the arena. They're training them for show purposes. 
they'll be tremendous in an arena. You take them outside the field, that horse loses its marbles when the leaves blow. And that, so that on by itself isn't good enough. At the same time, if you're always riding your horse in other locations, if just trail riding, I should say, so if you just go out and follow trails all the time, usually what happens there is you end up with a horse that's really quiet, really used to a lot of stuff, and they steer like a cruise ship. You'll go across the pasture, you'll start pulling, by the time you get to the very end of the field, you've kind of started to change some directions. And that, and if you go, and I go to a lot of clinics, where, which I teach at, and I get on horses that have only been ridden on trails, and the person will say, he's very well trained, and you're going across the arena, you're trying to turn, and your arm is shaking, and you're like, yeah, I'm really good. <laughs> and that, the stop is usually about the same, you pull them up to a stop like this, Usually that's because the only time they stopped is when the horse in front of them stopped, so they stopped too because they didn't want to bump into the butt. And that, so you really need to rotate between the both of those. You need to work on maneuvers, finesse, bending, moving off leg pressure, moving off rein pressure, but then you also have to expose your horse to as much things as many things as possible. Mix those two together and you have a pretty well-rounded horse. Only do one or the other and you're going to have your own list of problems. Uh, one thing I'm just going to touch on real quick here is the concept of natural horsemanship versus what you might call non-natural or old world, not old world, but older time horsemanship. And that, and there's been whole books written about this, so I'm just gonna do this real quick. The natural horsemanship deal, it's, it's been around for a long time. Basically, it's just good horsemanship. Natural horsemanship is looking at a training situation from the horse's point of view and setting it up in such a way that that horse can learn it the fastest. The older style that maybe would get, we would pick on a little bit nowadays, would be, I need this horse to do whatever, and I'm gonna make him do it one way or another, and he's damn well gonna do it, he's gonna do it when I say so, how I say so. That style of training, they're not so interested in the process, how the horse got there. It's sort of looked at as, if I have to hurt their feelings to get there, that's fine. And that, now, in reality, a lot of horses got turned out this way, they were actually good horses and that they got the job done, the horse was well trained, et cetera, et cetera. The problem is a lot of times the training took longer than it needed to, and then you scared a lot of horses in the process. So you'd have a horse really get after to make them do something, the horse would get upset and excited, you'd drive through, still get the job done, but you were left with a horse that was sort of unsure and maybe a little bit scared of you. The natural horsemanship came on, probably big, starting 20, 25 years ago, and uh, that was kind of when the DVDs and the books and the tapes started going around, stuff like that, the clinics got big. Now, like anything that people do, they take it too far. Natural horsemanship was a good idea, and is a good idea, but people started getting a little too fluffy. And what I mean by that is you'd have some trainers come out and they would give you a line like, ah, uh, yes, I just look in their eyes for five minutes, we read each other's soul, he'll come to me, and then we will ride off into the sunset. And then everyone said, oh, that's awesome, here's 50 bucks for your book. <laughs> then they would go home, look into their eyes, get on, the horse would throw them through the fence. <laughs> and that was about the end of that one. And then it was a little bit of a reality check. And uh, when that was coming on big, that was right at the same time that I started starting Colts for the general public. And that was something, I used, used to be very calm and I would get a phone call and somebody would say, well first I should say, there's a lot of folks going around and I'm guilty of it too because I do it too, but they would put on demonstrations and it's here's how to start a cold in an hour or something like that. And I've done it and it's, again, you can learn these points but you have to spread them out uh, on your own time generally. But anyways, someone would go to a clinic on the weekend, watch a cold get started, they think, that was easy. They held up and they got on. I can do that. And that, uh, then they'd phone me up and they'd say, I'm thinking about sending a horse for training, but maybe I'll just do it myself. Like, okay, whatever you want to do. And then one day they would look at it and think, that's eh, an hour till lunch and that's all time it takes to train a horse, so I'll go train my horse before I have lunch this afternoon. They'd go out, set, addle them up. The result was I get a phone call a week later, can you take the horse? And uh, you say, yeah. I've had a few times they unloaded the horse, the owner's got their arm in a sling. <laughs> say, did you try to start it? No. <laughs> what happened to your arm? I fell. <laughs> Off what? <laughs> and uh, so, again, you're watching people that, they were, went out and watched people that had done this for 20, 30 years and thought, oh, easy, I'll do that, no big deal. And that, uh, so, 
this is where the natural horsemanship, it was the right idea, but maybe sometimes it's gone off the rails. You'll have people say, oh, you can never correct a horse, let them do whatever the heck they want. Oh, he kicks you. That must mean he's hungry. Give him a treat. <laughs> and, that, and then afterwards, my horse is bushy and I just don't get it. <laughs> Thinking, I do. And that, and so does your horse. Or there, and a lot of times you'll have somebody say, I want my horse to like me. And that kind of jumps into another area, which is horses actually want a leader. And people have a really, really, really hard time understanding where they need to fit in on a horse's pecking order. And they'll say, uh, first off, I think most of you know, horses have a pe pecking order. One horse is here, one horse is here, so, so down the line. When somebody says you need to be the top of the pecking order, the image that flashes through a lot of people's mind is, oh, I'm not, I'm good. that's somebody that's gonna go out and hit the horse and tell them I'm the boss and da 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 da. So I don't wanna do that. I'm gonna be really calm, kind and really soft. As a result, they let their horse walk all over them, push them, kick them, be really rude to them, and they look at it as the horse likes them. And that, well, it's pretty easy to like somebody that gives you treats and then you kick them out of the way and go on with your day and stuff like that. So no, that isn't the horse likes you. That, the horse looks at you as the muffin wagon. And that, what you need to do is move, you need to be at the top of the order. That does not mean you have to be mean about it to be there. And that your horse would actually not mind if you were the leader. And that the way a horse's hierarchy works is the lead horse is actually the one that's responsible for more things. If there's a problem, that's the horse they all kind of look to and take guidance from and things like that. The way I look at it is if I was riding a horse and I'm riding down a road, it's pretty narrow and there's a transport truck coming towards me the other way, and you're thinking, oh, well, this is going to be snug. And that if you have a horse that looks at you as a poor leader, chances are that horse is going to be like, oh, this is bad. This, this idiot on my back will never figure this out. I'm going to take the reins. Hold on. There. And then they say, I, okay, there's two options. I could step aside or jump in front of the truck. I better jump in front of it. And, uh, or something like that. If you're the leader, chances are that horse is still going to get scared, but you might feel them tremble a little bit beneath you, but if you've done your proper work ahead of time, the horse, if you're calm, cool, and collected, hopefully that horse will be like, well, he seems good with it, so hopefully you'll get through this and carry on with your day. That's sort of the difference between leadership and not. And generally, the, more, the worse the situation you get into, the more the lack of leadership reveals itself. If you're standing at the, in the barn on a calm, sunny day, your horse is probably being pretty good to get along with. You take your horse out somewhere new for the first time in a different area, and it's windy and blowing and stuff is going by you, that's when you're going to start kind of seeing where you really fit in as far as whether that horse listens to you or not. Um, I'll just say, real, try again. Any other questions on anything we've covered so far? I'll get some at the end as well. <laughs> okay, uh, that's fine, it doesn't matter, we'll just carry on with what we're doing here. Um, my training program, it's, uh, you don't have to copy my program. Some of the things I'll do, for instance, if I'm, just a few highlights, with the bit, I'll take and put the bit on them in the stall and let them wear that for an hour at a time, maybe do that a couple times just so they learn how they can carry that bit. Um, it's just a way they can be introduced to it without me being involved. Sometimes the best training you can do is when you're not there. If you can let the horse kind of teach himself something, you don't need, you don't really need to be part of every single training scenario. Just letting horses get used to something is a big deal. When I sell, I'll get them used to different scary things. I'll rub a, a blanket over them, a horse blanket. I'll have a tarp sometimes, rub them over with the tarp. After that, usually it's pretty easy to get the saddle on. Uh, one thing I'm going to say here real quick, when, in regards to saddling your young horses, sometimes you get people on two very op opposite ends of the spectrum. One person will barely do the saddle up at all, and then they try to move their horse around with the saddle. The problem you might run into, if the saddle turns over and gets under their belly, and that horse starts running, and that thing's slapping them under the guts, they're going to start stomping into the ground, and you are going to absolutely terrify your colt. And uh, I've, I've done that once or twice, kind of learned my lesson and never did it again. And that you want to make sure that thing is on there snug enough it isn't moving. If that turns and they scare themselves bad, you're going to have a lot of work to do to get back just to square one. On the opposite end, if you throw the saddle on and pull it as tight as you can, and that horse feels like it's 
being cut in half and they are up from that. It would be better than the first option, but it's still not very good because that's sort of how you create a stingy horse. And uh, so you don't want to get into that one. Um, just another little point, you know, kind of dealt with the preparation question that got done earlier is, as far as groundwork goes, it is a very, very good idea to do a lot of groundwork. Now, I do have to, a little bit of confession, as a horse trainer, there's some people I run into and you can see they're struggling with their horse. They let the horse walk all over them, push them around, do all kinds of bad thing, things with them. And then they'll say to me, I'm sending you a colt for training. It's going to be really easy. I've done all the groundwork. You're thinking to yourself, because I'm nice, I go, thank you. <laughs> Under my breath, I go, shit. <laughs> and uh, because what's going to happen is that colt, they haven't done any good groundwork. What they've done is played with a bunch of exercises. The horses pushed them around, lost all respect for them. They've made them worse than they ever would have been. I wish they were. I wish the horse had been left alone and not messed with. So if you want to start working with your horse on the ground, great, do it. Don't get off track though. Make sure you get the stuff you're doing, you're accomplishing. Don't just go to you fail on one exercise and try something else doesn't work, then try something else that doesn't work. You want to make sure your groundwork is really solid. Also gear your groundwork towards your ridden work. What I mean by that is if you teach your horse to stand on a pedestal and wave a flag, that's neat and it's kind of fun. Probably isn't going to teach him to, to ride very well and stuff like that. So by teaching your horse a bunch of that stuff, that's nice, but that isn't necessarily going to prepare your horse for what he needs to know. You need to sort of make a point of do stuff that the horse needs to look to learn to be a good riding horse. Put the bridle on, teach them to give to the reins while you're standing on the ground. That's really going to help you when you get on their, on their back. Do things like that. Get them used to the saddle. Stuff like that. Make sure your groundwork is geared towards your ridden work if you are planning on getting on. If you just want to have fun with your horse and do different groundwork exercises, nothing wrong with that in the world. But don't teach him a bunch of little tricks and then say, oh, he's ready to ride, hop on. Chances are you're going to hop off a lot faster than that. So um, as far as the actual talk part of it, I've got a few questions here that I've had people send me that I can touch on. But do we have any questions here in regards to training? Yes? Oh, you just got the short end of the stick. <laughs> so it's not necessarily starting a young horse. Um, mm -hmm. So she's she's already broke. We just got her, um, but she doesn't like to connect. Mm -hmm. And where she came from, she doesn't like to get caught either. Okay. So I don't. All our other horses we've had for years and years, and we're all you know the hierarchy's kind of set. But it's, she's kind of found her spot with the horses, but I can't find a spot with her. How do I? So when you're working with her, do you find that she's, she just sort of ignores you and just does her own thing, kind of disregards you a little bit, or? It's not like she listens, but I guess with my other horses, I have a connection. Mm -hmm. You know, with her, unless I have a halter and a lead shank on her, when she has that on, she's like, okay, I'll do this, I'll do that. But when it's off, she doesn't, she's not connected to anybody okay. as yeah. far as two layers go. And I don't know how to, I've never had a horse like that. Like, sure. It's just sort of like, so it's almost like she's a single person horse and I'm not a person. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Yeah. Um, there's been a million things that could be done. Some of that's just probably going to come with time. Um, and she, she's hard to get caught, that's you said. Yeah. Okay. Um, Okay, yeah, yeah, no, that's fine. Um, something I, I do sometimes, if I have one that's not watching me, which is sort of somewhat what you're saying, and that what I'll do is I'll have a lead rope run to the horse and have maybe oh, six, eight feet of length between you and the horse. Then I'll hold the lead rope in both hands and hold, them about, hold it about here, right in the center of my chest. Then what I'll start doing is walking backwards if the horse doesn't start to fall, it's going to start falling pretty quick because the rope's going to tighten. But I'm not going to lengthen tight the rope. I'm just going to back up and keep the rope steady. And that, so I'm just going to start backing up around the field or the arena or whatever. So the horse is going to be walking towards me. Then what I'm going to do is watch that horse's expression. Every time its eyes or ears flip one way or the other, it will go the opposite direction. So for instance, if you were backing up, and your horse looks this way, make a really fast, sharp turn the opposite way, back up really quick. Again, don't pull the lead rope, but because you backed up quickly, that rope is going to tighten and pull the horse towards you pretty quick. 
and that, the faster you can back up, the better. You don't have to fly all over the place, but heavy and stuff like that. He's going to turn and look at you. Then you're just going to keep on backing. The eyes are going to, at some point, the ears are going to go one way or the other. As soon as the horse acknowledges something other than you, sharp, turn the opposite way again, keep on going. After a while, as you're backing up, you're going to watch that horse. It's going to be like this. It's not going to take its eyes off you because it's going to look at it as, every time I look away, that sneaky bugger disappears. <laughs> there, so that, they're pretty shifty, so I better keep my eyes focused on them. And that if you do a bit of that, it, it, even uh, two minutes at a time, it can be really surprising how much all of a sudden that focus starts going on to you. Now, every so often, just bring them up to you and really rub on, sort of let them know that coming up to you was actually the place where they could stop and relax and rest and stuff like that. <coughs> you can start taking the same thing a little bit farther with um, the catching because take your horse, do that exercise, then maybe do it with a longer lead. Call her name or whistler, whatever cue you decide to take. Take a couple steps backwards and then reel in the longer line at the same time. Bring them up to you. The cue to be caught should be catch their attention, whistle or call their name or whatever it is. When they're looking at you, take a couple steps back. You create a space for that horse to fill. In the theory, they will come up to you. It's going to take a while to get that on them, so be prepared for that. Another thing is just sometimes quality time with them. So like after a ride, spend a little while rushing on and stuff like that. Kind of get them where they enjoy being around you. A lot of times a hard to catch horse, the way they look at it is, every time I see that person coming, I have to work. And that, so it's, it's hard not to do that by accident. But if they kind of see you coming and have sort of a pleasant experience from it, sometimes it's good. Also going out, catching them, rub them for a few minutes and let them go without having to work with them. That could be a good thing as well. I guess you're doing that already. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, in that case, I think you've already kind of gone as far as she's willing to be around you and stuff, stuff like that. But I would do some of that stuff, like kind of calling them in, practice teaching that horse to come to you a little bit that way. When they kind of learn that the safety or the pleasant spot is with you, they just start becoming easier to catch. They just start to like you a little more because they look at it, well, when I'm with them, that's when things are good. So those are that's a little exercise I would play with. Okay. You talked about groundwork exercises. Yep. Do you do ground driving? Uh, sometimes yes, sometimes no. Typically, I personally don't. And uh, it's not because I don't think it's a good idea, though. I should point that out. The reason is, the way I started Colts, I started them without the ground driving, and I basically got the knack of doing it without the ground driving part. Now, something I really did an awful lot was I really practiced getting light hands. And that so a lot of times I would take a when I was younger I would put a bridle on the back of a chair and then I would hold the reins and I would practice lengthening and shortening the reins and changing lengths and stuff like this and I got where I feel like I was fairly handy at it and that so then I found when I was riding colts it really helped me a lot because I could get a pretty good feel of them without them actually knowing a whole lot about getting to the bridle uh, the ground driving though it is a good thing I would maybe say the, uh, originally, I, I had the first couple horses I had for training uh, that were really, really tough, and they were sort of the type you're thinking, do I really want to get on this horse <laughs> or not? My thought was, I'll ground drive them first, so that'll get that part done. I snapped up the, the lines on them, but because they were basically hard horses to get along with anyways, they blew forward, tore the lines out of my hands, now they're running around with flying wrapped around them. And that, so I made a bad situation worse, <clears throat> and that, so. The ground driving, again, I think it's a, a good thing. I would say we start it in a fairly small area. You want it where if that horse starts to pick up speed, if it's a small pin, you can just kind of step to the center of the pin and let the horse go around and you don't risk losing the lines. Another thing is with that one, I would recommend getting a helper for the first lesson or two because sometimes when you go to ground drive them, they'll, they'll be a little bit confused and they'll start turning. They'll get themselves wrapped a little bit and then now you're in a little bit of trouble. If you have a friend or a helper, just kind of lead the horse forward while you just gradually start to introduce it. The horse gets the idea that all I have to do is go forward and turn and stuff like this. So yeah, it is a good idea. And uh, I don't do it a lot, but it is good. But I would say maybe get the somebody to give you a hand for the first couple. One more back here. One more back here. I have a young horse who's been really nice to start in. Okay, good. You always sound to an amazing trainer. <laughs> I hear he's good looking. Yes. <laughs> um, Brown, you didn't hear that. Um, I'm 
playing with her trying to keep her soft and even soften her up a little bit. Weird her up already. <laughs> um, but it's through the rib cage that I just can't seem to really to soften her. Yeah. Do okay. You any suggestions? Yep. Uh, of course I do. Send her back. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Before money, we can do anything. Yeah. <laughs> the secret is. How much money you got? Yeah. <laughs> no, um, with the ribs, they will sometimes get a little tight. Now, I didn't really say about it because it's hard. Some of the horse training stuff is pretty hard to say without demonstrating. But with the horse, I think it's really a good idea. You need to get control of every part of the horse's body. Now, I don't mean eyelash number three from the left. And that I, you want to have it where you have control of the horse's face. They'll bend side to side. They'll bend vertically up and down. They'll move their shoulders, they'll move their hind end, and they'll move their ribs. Now the ribs you can't move individually because they're stuck in the middle, no legs are tied to them. But basically the ribs is side passing or leg yielding, is the way I look at it. A lot of times if I find one's getting a little bit stiff and uh, jammed up a little bit, what I'll do, so say I'm trying to move the horse to the right, and kind of soften the ribs up going right, I'll ride a left hand circle, so I'm circling, I'm circling, I'm circling, while the horse is still walking, I'll put a little bit of pressure on both reins, squeeze my left leg, move that horse side past him a couple steps over as I'm walking, and then ride forward out of it. And that, so I'll do that exercise quite a bit. So you're going on your circle, basically you pick up a little bit, lay the inside leg on them, move them over a step or two, and then just ride forward. You might side pass them a couple steps, three or four times before you make a full circle. And then change the size of your circles. A small circle, the horse can be more bent, it's easier to do. A big, as your horse gets better, go on a bigger and a bigger and a bigger circle. The horse will be a little bit straighter. You'll kind of iron out those kinks and stuff like that. So that would be the main one, I would say, for the, the stiffness to the, to, the, to the leg pressure. Because stiffness in the ribs is a resistance to leg pressure. So it's just something to keep in mind. Anything you can do from the ground to help? Can you do it from the ground? Yeah, it's, it is a little bit tricky on the ground. Um, what I would do in that case is, if I, I would do the same exercise, but I would hold the horse, um, I would put the bridle on, I would use the bridle, not the halter probably, and I would hold the, the rein maybe four or five inches from the bit, and I would have a training stick in my other hand, I would have the training stick upside down so the long part is below, so I would have the horse circle around me, and then at some point I would walk towards the horse, tap him in the ribs, ask him to take one step away from me, and then just keep him walking. So you sort of walk with him, over, 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 keep walking, over, 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 keep walking. And uh, sometimes they'll just sort of freeze up. So sometimes the first couple times you've got to tap a little bit harder to get them off that pressure. But once you've done it a few times, they generally get the gist of it pretty quick. Stuff like that, so just something to keep in mind. But, uh, any other questions here? Uh, I'll pass it over to him. Pass, please. Yeah. Do you use spurs to train and when do you introduce those? Okay, this is, uh, the question is do, if and when do I use spurs? This is one of these say as I do and not as I do answers. Um, I personally start riding with them really early on, but the reason for that isn't that I need more severity. The reason is I'm trying to get the horses used to as much stuff as I can possibly get them used to so they don't get surprised later in life. And that's so like for example my western saddles all have a back cinch on them a lot of people don't ride with the back cinch but if i get used to the back cinch from the very first ride they're used to it forever after it's kind of the same thing with the spurs i put on a really dull pair and uh once they once they know how to steer a little bit and i'm reasonably sure they're comfortable with me on their back i'll ride with them but the sort of the secret to using them if you're going to use them is a spur if they roll they're meant to be rolled not poked and that. So what most people do is they get on with spurs and they've seen enough John Wayne movies, they jump on, <laughs> then the horse goes, <laughs> and that. What you want to do when you want your colt to move off of spur pressure, you kind of tip your toe down, rock your foot, turn your foot to the outside, tip your toe, excuse me, tip, tip your toe, can't talk to it, and then you kind of lightly roll your spur up the side a little bit and you move them off that pressure that way. It's supposed to be very soft and very smooth. If you use it like a harpoon and poke, it's a really, really bad idea. And uh, so another thing is, keep in mind your young horse in the beginning, every young horse is going to spook a little bit at some point in their life. If you're not used to this, used to riding with spurs, what's going to happen is you're going to be riding your horse, it's going to spook 
jump a little to the side, you're gonna squeeze the hold on, spur them for doing it, and now you're maybe into a little bit of trouble. And that, so generally I say don't use them. And that, again, I do because I'm trying to get them used to it, but I'm very, very soft with them. And I've kind of taught myself that when Colt does something wrong, I kind of shove my feet up to the side to hold myself into the saddle as opposed to squeeze the hold on with them. So I hope that answers your question. Just, just to follow up on that one, what about a whip, like instead, like say I have a young horse who doesn't want to move, period, right? And you don't want to use spurs, so could you just okay, yep. tap with a whip instead of killing your legs? Or? Yep. Uh, that again, yes. Again, it just sort of depends on the person. Um, a lot of times, because I ride with split reins, I don't need a whip because I was kind of taking into my rein. Yeah, it's hopeless. Frankly, frankly, there's no hope for you. I don't think I'm very good. And there, just, just, just get off the horse, go sip tea, and. and The thing is, if they just plain will not move, what I'll very often do is go in a round pen. I'll ride the horse and I'll get somebody else on the ground. They'll have a, a lunge whip or a long stick, a little bit of a bag on the end. And I get them just to sort of create a stimulus to get the horse rolling. That way there, I can just worry about holding on, just going for the ride. The horse will get comfortable with carrying me around at different speeds, and then uh, it's real easy. But if you get on and start whipping and kicking, you'll, sometimes you'll actually make them shut down. So the helper, that's one time where the helper is really helpful. And that, but uh, I think that's about the end of my deal here. So we, you're uh, probably looking at your watch, going, "Why is she letting him go over by 15 minutes?" Lori never lets anyone do that. I didn't realize I did. Well, well, um, our next presenter, Ellie Ross, has huge technological issues. She sent me her email or her presentation, and it went all wonky. So. They're magically trying to fix it out there. Um, so Ellie's probably going to come and start without her presentation, but that's why, so we're late because of that. But it's been amazing, and it's been wonderful to have Jason speak. Yeah. It was so amazing, we couldn't just stop you. That would have been important. <laughs> but thank you.